Um, welcome to this second webinar in the uh, in the series uh, that we're running um, thanks to the Global Center for Species Survival at Indianapolis Zoo um, um, for them hosting. Uh, thanks to them for hosting this series. And the reason, the impetus behind the series was to provide an opportunity to introduce. Um, a, a range of species conservation planning tools that we, the conservation planning specialist group, have at our disposal um, to those people who are either embarking on a species conservation planning journey or thinking about toe dipping into it. Maybe you've done a lot of red listing and you're, and you're thinking, you know, what next? Um, and so this is to sort of give you a bit of signposting, I suppose, to, uh, to the, some of the tools and processes that are out there that you can then take advantage of. Now, this is not meant to be an exhaustive um, list of the range of, of planning tools that you can turn to. Uh, there are lots of processes out there, um, many of them very, you know, very thoughtfully uh, worked out, very helpful for different sorts of contexts. What we're going to do in this series of webinars is introduce you to a number of uh, planning processes and tools that the conservation planning specialist group has developed um, over its 40 or so years of uh, existence to help us as an organization helping people like you and other organizations to plan for species that you you care about so over the course of the series we will be touching on different processes and tools uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about uh, the different webinars coming up, the forthcoming webinars uh, coming up in, in due course, um, probably towards the end of this particular webinar. In this particular webinar, uh, it's a chance for us to, uh, as we're only the second webinar in in the series, it's a chance for us to talk through some of the practical steps, the sort of generic planning steps, the, the things you would actually do in order to develop uh, species conservation plans in a collaborative manner. In the last webinar, we talked about the principles and that webinar, um, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's already up there, but um, it will be up on the, the um, Indianapolis Zoo, the Global Centers um, website, uh, along with the CPSG website. So you can go and have a look at the principles, those foundational that foundational philosophy that underpins all of the tools and processes that we apply. But what we're going to do going forward with these webinars is look at the practicalities of putting these principles into practice. And as I say, beginning with this sort of generic planning process that, um, that sometimes gets squashed and, and squeezed and pulled apart a little bit, um, but, but often um, you know, in av on average, you will see similar sorts of steps coming up. And actually, if you're familiar with other pro planning processes, you're going to see lots of resonance with those process steps. The way the webinar is going to work is that I'm going to um, give a presentation uh, and then we'll have about 20, 25 minutes of open discussion to take us to the end of the first hour or, or roughly around that time. And then in the second hour, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a heads up, I'll let you know when it's coming, um, but we're gonna really give a chance for people to say, right, I've, you know, either that's great, I've had my introduction, then carry on with your day or evening, um, or you'd like to go a bit further and um, ask further questions, um, reflect a bit more on some of these practicalities um, that are talked about in this particular, in the, in the presentation. And we, we may start, we'll stay together as a, as a whole group for a while, but if it feels as if um, it's not allowing enough people to be able to have a chance to, to share their thoughts, then we might split into working groups in that, in that second part of the webinar, just so we get a chance for everybody to, to participate. So there'll be come two key parts of the webinar, presentation plus open discussion. And then we will have, have that second se um, section um, when those people that want to can stay on. And it would be lovely if all of you wanted to join, but I appreciate you may be busy and need to, some of you may need to move on. Um, uh, and then those people that stay will go a bit further into um, some of the, the realities of putting these, these steps into practice. And also have a chance to take some 
questions that you might have around particular planning processes that you might be involved in at the moment or concerned about that are coming up um, shortly. To, uh, before I start the presentation, uh, and maybe it's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit after the fact, but I'm going to introduce you um, to, um, to the, the two CPSG um, staff members that are here. Um, Phil, you're, um, uh, you're on just now. So can I ask you to, as I'm doing everything back to front, I'm going to start with you and then I'm going to come back to me and then I'll do the presentation. Okay, Jamie, that sounds great. I will do whatever. I will do whatever you want me to do. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Phil Miller. I uh, work along with Jamie at the Conservation Planning Specialist Group. I've been with the organization for quite a while, um, but uh, have continued to kind of help um, evolve the organization and expand our capacities to incorporate different types of quantitative and um, analytical processes and tools into the decision making process. You'll hear a little bit more about that from Jamie later on. And then um, later on in this um, in this webinar series, I'll be I'll be leading a particular section on on the use of some of those tools. So that's my primary um, responsibility and primary interest. And I um, work in the in the main office, kind of the headquarters office of CPSG in Minnesota in the US. So it's really Really good to be here. Looking forward to hearing what Jamie's got to say. Thanks, Phil. I'm not sure whether you really are. Um, I think you know what I'm going to be saying. <laughs> but anyway, um, thanks for thanks for those those words. Um, and uh, so, yeah, my name is Jamie Copsey, and I work alongside Phil, um, particularly focusing on the on the training side, and then having a chance to kind of dabble on the the the, the applying those the, that that training, the principles and the steps. Um, to species conservation planning work and I'll share some of my experiences in doing so um, when we do the presentation just uh, just now. So I'm going to just share my screen. Okay, yes, thanks for asking about the live transcriptions, but we're just putting that on as well. Okay. Uh, Kelly, um, you're on my on my screen at the moment. So can I just check that you can you can see my shared uh, PowerPoint slide before I get started? Yes, I can. Thanks very much for that. So in this webinar, what we're going to do is begin looking at those practical steps that you would take, that you might take others through in helping them to develop a principle into practice. So just to um, just a bit of background, I suppose, on, on, on us so everyone is clear. Um, the conservation planning specialist group is, um, it, as like many specialist groups, has a number of members, over 200 or so. Um, importantly for us, we have a number of regional resource centers, and you'll see them illustrated on this, uh, this slide here, uh, which uh, involve organizations that have staff that are able to give a proportion of their time to be able to further the work of the conservation planning specialist group to be able to help people in their region to plan for species that they care about and this is our mission it's you know, saving species saving threatened species by increasing the effectiveness of conservation efforts so we help others who are doing the conservation work um, come together and work out uh, and agree on collaborative plans of action to save species and what this webinar series is about, well, what our sort of regular mantra that we repeat to ourselves is, is, you know, how do we ensure that every species that needs a plan is covered by an effective and implemented plan? Now we undertake our planning work um, through workshops that we run both virtually and in person 
through the development of science-based tools, which Phil's been um, um, uh, critical in the, in, in the development of um, over the years that he's been with CPSG, and then through training and mentoring others. And as I mentioned before, um, and if you want to know about these principles, and please have a look at that, that, that first webinar uh, that will be on our, on our website, that all of the processes that we talk about, all of the tools that we talk about using are, are, have been developed and are, and are applied because they help with the application of these fundamental seven principles. It's philosophy of collaborative planning that underpins everything that we do. I wanted to just briefly draw your attention to a couple before we go into the process steps in a bit more depth, partly because if you're, you may well have uh, experience of red listing or other forms of workshop um, and, uh, and, and decision, conservation decision um, in which uh, groups of people come together to make those decisions. Uh, and the key thing, that is important to recognize as far as these principles are concerned and definitely from our experience what really matters in achieving the development of effective implemented plans is that everybody who has an impact on can be impacted by or, or have expertise to contribute to the development of the plan are stakeholders as far as we're concerned and should be as far as possible included um, participate in the development of that plan and the decision making around that and this means that you might have people who are you know deep experts in those species alongside others who may live alongside the species alongside government representatives uh, in a recent workshop that I've been involved in we had power line companies involved in it who weren't naturally thinking about the species but are very clearly have an impact on any plan where electrocution is a, is a big problem for those species and so they are it's not just a question of kind of taking the plan to them afterwards and saying you know this is what we want you to do but if we want them to do things differently then we need to include them in the development of the plan itself. And there's a, the, the one plan approach um, specifically looks at how one puts together you know, um, or, or at least considers the potential role of ex situ with in situ um, um, actors uh, in, in the conservation of species. It's not to say that ex situ um, work in captivity is always going to be part of the recovery efforts of a species, but we should put all options on the table to begin with. And we would encourage others to do that in order to then make sure that uh, whatever does stay on the table, um, whichever groups do stay together and develop the plan, are really going to be the best ones to have most chance on effectively conserving those species. And the second principle I wanted to draw your attention to is this one around neutral facilitation. Um, because some of you, particularly if you are um, leading or co-running um, uh, co-chairing specialist groups you, know, you you obviously care about the species that are in your group and you may be thinking well you know if, if I'm supposed to be neutral um, how do I you know I'm not neutral in this process I do care I do have a view on what needs to happen for these species and there are situations where that uh, that need you have to be part of the the content discussions to be involved in the decision making means that you be the most appropriate person to also then design and um, and sort of lead on that uh, planning process because you may not be perceived as being neutral uh, and so what comes out the end um, stakeholders may sometimes um, feel as if you know is it was it was it in some way swayed um, and therefore perhaps reduce their level of buy-in to the plan now it's not black and white I think there is a, a continuum, a spectrum, and at one end where you have trust being very low between stakeholders, when complexity is very high, when uncertainty is very high as well around the information. In those situations, then the need for neutrality in the facilitation of, of the process is particularly pronounced. But if, if, the, if, if actually, you know, you've got some, there's reasonable understanding of what's going on, or at least there's not a high levels of distrust between stakeholders, 
then perhaps there's it, you know it's 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 important that you that you are objective and and you are uh, um you you do make sure that you um that all stakeholders are equal and are able to have an equal say in the in the uh, development of the plan but there may it may be easier for you to take on more of a facilitation role so it's it's a bit of a, a spectrum of neutrality depending on how complex uncertain and um distrustful i suppose that people might be within the process but it is definitely a principle that you need to to think carefully about before you embark on leading on your own planning processes so anyway have a look at another web the other webinar to find out more about these about these principles what we're going to focus in on today are is the above the ground um, part of the work um, the things that you actually see the the steps that stakeholders will be taken through as they um, develop their conservation plan it's the you know coming to life of the of the principles and I think it's appropriate that we, we use this, this model or this diagram of a tree to symbolize the principles and steps, because the steps, a bit like leaves, do move around a bit. Um, and sometimes the, those steps come together, they overlap, they, or, or sometimes they're extended and, and certain steps need to be much, much bigger in one process than in another. Um, what we need to do is to flex those steps in order to ensure that the process is fit for purpose. However, there are these eight steps that, that often um, sort of map out in a planning process, and that's what we're really going to focus in on today. So we're going to begin with and then we'll go through sharing, learning, and improving. And each time we will we'll give you some examples of um, the kind of the to, to be able to illustrate those steps in practice. So beginning with this first step, preparing to plan, this is this is a critical one, and one that I think that well, I'm still learning about about how much needs to happen at this point in the process. And far too often, uh, and you may have experienced this yourself, uh, there's a there's a tendency to to want to plan for things um, quite quickly. So you decide you want to make a plan, and before you know it, you know in a few weeks' time, you're trying to gather people together um, in order to develop the plan. And just like in any process, if you're actually pushing it, then the chances are that it's not going to be as good as it could be. There's also the, 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 some of the principles also, I think, underpin the need to take time over this step. Thinking about inclusive participation uh, and taking time to work out who really needs to be there to ensure that the plan is effective is a key part of the process and this often will come down to um, the group of people who come together to to decide sorry, um, the group of people who come together um, in order to help design the process and we describe them as the organizing team and what will, what will often happen is you you might get approached by one person or you may be the person who says we need to develop a plan for this species and what we would encourage um, you to do is to not do that individually, but to say, right, well, who could I could I identify a core group it needs to be functional. So, you know, three to five, maybe six people or so um, of stakeholders from the broader pool that are key to the success of the project who maybe represent government, represent expertise, represent stakeholders that are going to be impacted by any work to sort of change human behavior or, or to change practices. And if you assemble a small subgroup of this organizing or a subgroup of stakeholders to form this organizing team, and this group we would work with anyway as external facilitators to help them flash, uh, sort of flush out or flesh out describe what it is they actually care about what are they actually planning for what sort of plan do they need to have at the end of the process why are they doing it now why are they not doing it um last you know last year or in, in two years time what's so special about now so help them to understand and to agree on their rationale for the desired product that they want to have coming out of this process and this is, is no small feat. It, it can take weeks, it can take months for the group to, to really get great clarity around what they want to achieve. 
Here's an example with the shrill cardia B in the UK, uh, which I was involved in a couple of years back. Um, initially, as I say, one or two people came to me and said, we want to develop a plan for this species. Um, and I encouraged them to think about who else might represent other organizations who um, could have an impact on this species, who could be this core organizing team that we could work with. And then with that group, ask them questions um, in order to clarify that they were concerned with these five or six populations of the species. It was just that species they were focused on. Um, uh, and uh, they, they wanted to have a 10-year strategic plan coming out, nothing much longer than that. And there were other aspects that they, they needed to clarify in order for me to be clear about the sort of process that might help them to get there. And with that information, uh, I then work with them uh, as a sort of a sounding board for me to give me advice. And I would suggest, well, what about this as a process back with questions and comments? And we identified a two-step process, a threat analysis workshop, workshop, which was largely composed of species experts. And that allowed them to develop an understanding of the system that they were working with, uh, identify some of the key threats. And then a second step, where a much broader group of stakeholders came together in order to take that information and say, right, well, what do we do about this? And, and that was in that broader workshop, the strategy was actually developed. And at this early stage in the process, right at the first step, we we're already thinking about you know, jumping forward and imagining the plan coming out the other end and considering what might the, organ what might the, um, the governance body B for this project? Who might need to be involved in overseeing implementation? What are the key organizations? And that helped us to track and make sure we picked up the right stakeholders to be in the main workshop, but also helped us to begin to imagine what that process might actually uh, might look like, that, that governance structure at the end. The second step in the process is defining success. And this is where you're, um, you're helping the group to, uh, to, to, to the stakeholders, and this will be the first time they probably come together uh, and helping them to agree on a definition of what good looks like. Um, when they get to the end of this plan, what will make them crack the champagne or sparkling lemonade, whatever it might be, and say, yes, we did it. And often that's clarified or uh, qualified in a vision statement or long-term goal, um, but getting that agreement at an early step in the stakeholder inclusive process around what success really looks like is a great way to, is a great social um, exercise of getting people who might be feeling quite disparate and unsure about each other, may, may trust may be low as well, um, helping them to listen to each other and realize that actually they do have some common needs, that they can accept um, some of the things that are of concern to people um, and, uh, and, and develop as a consequence some shared definition. It gives them direction, uh, a bit like a, sort of the North Star for, a, a, um, uh, for, for mariners when they're out at sea. And they're not necessarily going to get to the star, but it makes sure that they're, they're tracking a true course, that they know what direction they're going on. So this definition is key to helping with that process. And here's an example um, with the Tamarau um, in the Philippines, where it, uh, the process involved um, indigenous groups as well as conservationists and governments, and had a long conversation around um, what needed to be in the statement. And there were discussions around coexisting as a word, as opposed to living alongside, um, and, and had to take into account the translations as well, and make sure that those words actually carried their meaning through whichever language they were, they were presented in. So this took a little while to develop, but this allowed the group to actually clarify the direction they were all aiming for with the species. The third step is around understanding the system. And this is where you're bringing together the best available information. Um, we talk in the principles webinar about or introduce the population viability analysis as a tool to help groups to not just bring information together, but to pool that data, analyze that da those data and identify how the population is currently, what trajectory it's on, what might happen um, 
as a consequence of different sorts of interventions. So as a way of helping them to understand what are the key factors they need to change. Now it can be done quantitatively um, or it can be done qualitatively where you actually are um, just developing a model, which I'm gonna to talk to you about in a second. Once that model is developed and they, they've got a, a, a clarity around how factors might connect together in order to threaten the species and drive it in a particular direction, they can then start saying, where do we want to intervene? You know, what, what taps do we want to turn off? Which taps do we want to turn on in order to try and influence the species to move in the direction that we want it to in terms of its, its, um, its status. Uh, now this is going to be uh, it's going to involve a lot of hypothesis often we're not dealing with facts we are dealing with hopefully informed assumptions but as long as the hypothesis has some logic behind it as long as there's agreement behind it that if we do this then it could well have this sort of positive effect on the species then you're able to move forward in a um, in an informed way in a way that allows you to apply those to, to make those decisions apply the resolution see what the response is and learn as a consequence and here's an example again from the shrill carder bee where they did a qualitative map of the different threats that were impacting the species and a lot of those are in are in red and then there were some key threats that stood out loss of hibernating habitat loss of genetic diversity etc these were the key threats that stood out for the group and they started to they took down those threats and started to 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 morph them into, into goal statements uh, and here's one of them landers and local communities uh, their appreciation is fostered in order to increase the perceived value and sense of responsibility for the shrill car to be so there are two components that we often will, will encourage groups to to um, uh, identify within their goal statements what they want to affect the change they want to affect in the system how they think that change will influence the species that they care about. So they're almost writing, they're writing goal statements in a, as if they're sort of simple hypotheses. If we do this, then we're expecting that to happen. And that gives a sort of anchor point for monitoring of the system so they can see if the intervention was applied, but also they can see if their hypothesis was correct. They did the intervention, but did it result in, in this case, increasing a sense of responsibility for the species. Step five is around agreeing how to intervene and this is where you're getting really into the nitty-gritty the detail of the actions that are going to taken going to be taken in order to put that those strategies and those goals into in or realize those goals. What steps are they going to take to realize the goals? Who's going to do them? When um, and when are they going to know when they've been achieved etc. And it might be you're having to make options, having to make decisions between different sorts of strategies, um, helping groups to weigh up one option versus another um, uh, to help them to do really good thinking, but also to build agreement around a course of action. And those are the two key elements you're constantly thinking about when you're working with groups to help them to develop these plans. Are they doing good thinking? And are they building agreement over that thinking? so that you can help people move forward together, but in, a, and in, in an, informed, um, an informed way. So this is, uh, I mentioned, uh, I think in the previous webinar around uh, the uh, bearded vultures that I've recently been involved in. And here's an illustration where population viability analysis has been employed and um, they identified three broad um, strategies um, the, the, they're written as categories here, but there's one that was to do with um, insurance plus mortality reduction. So they wanted to try and reduce mortality in the wild for the bearded vulture, but they did also want to look at how they could build up a, an in situ population that could be a safety net in case things went wrong for the species in the wild. So there's one strategy or set of strategies and scenarios that were around this insurance plus mortality reduction. There was another one around augmentation where they would, would use the ex situ population to be able to boost the wild population. So they weren't doing mortality reduction there, they were just, um, just adding animals in from captivity to see how that would influence the system and the population status. 
And then the third set of scenarios was based around augmentation plus, where they did a combination of um, augmentation, so ex situ animals re bred up and then released or, or they're hacked out, at a released at a very young age back out to the wild, plus mortality reduction. So these had those three sets of strategies and they were using those to sort of weigh up which one was having the most impact on the species and which one also uh, allowed them to achieve things like minimize cost. So building agreement around what needs to happen. They need to specify what is done, what is to be done, um, agreeing on who is going to do what, when and by who, uh, um, and when and how are they going to know when it has been achieved. This is why building agreement is so important, because at this point in the pr planning process, you're getting very close to people having to go out to do something. And you'll know yourselves that the more that it's more likely that you're going to go and do it. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to stop sharing that just now. Um, oh, sorry. I'm just going to stop that just now. I think what's happened. Okay, I stopped, so I just need to share my screen again. What happened there? Okay. All right. Um, hopefully, you can all see this screen. So, you've got this specifying. Let me just go back one slide. Um, specifying what is to be done. So uh, agreeing on who's going to do what, um, by when, and how is everybody going to know when it's done. You need to be able to spend time building the agreement around the, the different stages beforehand, around the vision, around goals, uh, around the strategies that are most likely to get them to where they want to get to. And if you can build that agreement, then when you come to helping the group to identify the specific actions, it is uh, uh, there's a higher likelihood that individuals, organizations involved will sign up to, will commit to undertaking those particular actions. So here's an illustration from the Bellinger River snapping turtle um, project where um, there's a, you've got the action there, but there's some additional detail that we're encouraging groups to, to, to get into around what's actually going to happen, who the lead agency is going to be, uh, when is it going to happen? How are they going to know when it's done? And in this case, looking at how does this action link to the different goals that were identified within the plan. So we're coming towards the end of the process now. Um, you are getting to the point where we describe as preparing to implement, where you're thinking about how does, how does the group um, organize themselves uh, in order to oversee implementation, communicate results, make decisions during the implementation phase as new information arises, et cetera. And so this is where the topic of governance comes up again. Um, we mentioned it back in preparing to plan where you start to think about or help the group to think about what organizations are gonna be involved in, and how they're going to be in. Um, and, uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then you're revisiting this particular point in the process. Uh, an illustration of this is with the Formosan pangolin, where the core group um, were able to identify, were, were, were able to be identified and they would coordinate uh, information and implementation of the plan, but then they'd have these subgroups that were, able, were established um, each with distinct responsibilities. So everybody knew how everyone was coordinated, what group to go to for what information uh, and, and how the project would be overseen. And then the last step in the process is around sharing, learning and improving. Um, this is the point where you, you, you've kind of reached the, the, the end of the process where you might want to evaluate that process, seeing how stakeholders, uh, the extent to which stakeholders did feel that they did some good thinking, that the right people were included, et cetera. Um, but also within the plan itself, you're wanting to encourage um, the groups or, or get the groups to think about how they're going to um, 
going to sort of review the plan during implementation in order to ensure that it, it stays fit for purpose. So there may, ch may be changes that need to happen as a consequence of new information coming out. And how, when are they going to do that? How are they going to do that to ensure that the plan stays true to what they're really trying to achieve? So these are the eight steps that, um, uh, that, that underpin this planning process or the, the, are the, the, the kind of tangible things that you're actually gonna see going from preparing to plan through defining success, understanding the system, identifying where to intervene, um, agreeing um, or specifying how to intervene, uh, agreeing and specifying what is to be done, preparing to implement, sharing, learning and improving. As I mentioned before, these steps don't always stay exactly in this order. They don't; step, they're not necessarily the same size in, in length and duration uh, or depth as well. Um, but they're often they often uh, um, allow for effective plans to be produced. We we'll regularly see this sort of pattern of steps that that that, that the planning process will go through. And just as a slight aside, and I suppose as a, a partly a sort of a, a, a long-term segue into, into Phil's presentation later on uh, in the series, um, but we, th th there are, we're obviously we're looking for tools and processes that help us to do the better, do better collaborative planning. And the Species Conservation Toolkit Initiative is um, one organization that we partner with that has developed a suite of tools and continues to develop tools to inform species conservation planning work. Phil will talk more about Vortex um, uh, later on in the, in the series of uh, population viability analysis tools um, that, that you can use, um, that, that one can use for, um, for, um, for helping you understand trajectories of populations and how those trajectories might change based on different interventions you might take. There's PMX, which is particularly helpful when you're dealing with ex situ population and how to manage those. Uh, Outbreak, which is a, a, a software um, which Phil, Phil will, I'm sure, explain to you better than I. It helps with understanding how disease might pass through populations and therefore make decisions uh, around that. And then meta model manager ways of bringing together the different modeling tools in order so that they can they can talk to each other and therefore inform the decision making. So all of these tools, all of these processes, they all have these principles in mind. They're all rooted in these 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 principles of collaborative work. And what I've just um, done um, now in this presentation is take you through some of those practical um, eight steps that are often um, embedded within uh, a sort of generic species conservation planning process. There's, uh, I think within the webinar series, we kind of, there's a link through to the principles and steps, but there are other resources as well, particularly on our website that would encourage you to go and have a, have a look at if you want to find out more. And do obviously come to our web website to look for training courses, to look at planning tools, look at guidelines, and to look at published plans too. Before we uh, wrap up, I just wanted to highlight that there are this sits within a series of webinars. Um, there's another one coming up on the, the 11th of, um, of July. Uh, around assessing to plan a process to help you move from red listing into speak into the planning work itself uh, and then other webinars that are going through um, into August and you'll find information on all of these at the uh, uh, on the um, Global Center for Species Survival website and thanks again to the Global Center for hosting these uh, this webinar series okay let me just come back out. All right, I'm just trying to come out of the webinar now and so I can stop sharing. Okay, uh, so, um, 
want to check first of all if there are any immediate questions coming out from from that webinar or any comments that anybody would would like to make and if you'd like to do so you can either write in the uh, in the chat or um, go to the reactions box in zoom and you can put your hand up um, or you can turn your mic on and i will come to you uh, and just keep an eye out for those people who are doing so. Does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to uh, like to raise or, or make? No questions whatsoever. No comments. Phil, would, before uh, we'll see if uh, hopefully there will be some questions and comments from the group. Um, but Phil, can I come to you and just see if there's anything? Um, I know there was a <laughs> intermission in my PowerPoint, which wasn't helpful. But I just wanted to check: is there anything do you think that I missed, or could be was worth emphasising um, for the group to help them understand better? Um, well. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, one of the things that I uh, one of the things that I thought of when um, you were talking about the organizing committee and kind of doing that preparing to plan again, as Jamie was mentioning, I would certainly um, emphasize the importance of that step um, uh, in 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 terms of just being able to kind of you know um, help ensure a smooth process farther down the road. You know, the earlier you can um, build a really strong foundation for the planning process, the more effective that planning process is going to be. And um, uh, I've always um, emphasized in that kind of organizing team, um, the importance of that being that, that, you know, periodic meetings of that group being a really kind of safe space for people to talk about the, the process as it's unfolding. Right. So, um, you know, if there are, you know, the the facilitators like Jamie and myself or other people within CPSG or 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 you here on the on the webinar who do this kind of work, you know, by definition, we are kind of external to the to the species conservation landscape for that particular species. So we don't know all the intricacies of interorganizational or, or or interpersonal issues, right? So so we need to understand those so that we can better um, uh, adapt to issues that might be arising um, where information may not be being shared or there are concerns or you know lack of proper collaboration between different entities that are involved in the plan in the in the planning process and so that organizing committee needs to be really really an important place where we can talk about those things really honestly you know um, before workshops are happening and even most importantly while planning workshops are happening so for example, you know, I will have meetings and I know Jamie does the same thing. We'll have meetings at the end of every day, um, either virtually or in person um, to just kind of get a get a temperature check from that organizing committee about how well the meetings are going. Are there any things that we need to be aware of? Any things that we're missing? Any any issues that are arising between people or organizations? And so that group is really, really important in kind of maintaining continuity and maintaining proper momentum in that planning process. So cannot emphasize the importance of that group enough. Thanks, Phil. Um, Julia, you're asking what were logistically what would this look look like? What would this typically happen with in-person meetings? How many meetings, etc.? Um, so if I, I, I'm going to have a stab, it's difficult to say generically because it does they do all vary, but there are some patterns. And then I'll see if, and Phil can add because he'll have more experience of this than I. Um, but so two things. One thing first, between virtual and in-person, there's a big difference. There are lots of differences. One of them, um, surprisingly, perhaps, is in the time it takes. You know, it feels like because you're in person, you should be able to, it's, you know, you've got to travel there and then you have to work. So you've got to travel back. It feels like it's going to take a lot of time. Um, in my experience, and I think in Phil's as well, the virtual side takes can take an awful lot longer. 
And um, it's for, I think there's a number of reasons. I think one of the reasons is that it can take longer. You're able to make take longer over it. You can't do that with, a, with an in-person workshop. You've got to get it done within that time frame. Um, and um, within a virtual space, you are able to kind of flex the process. And we are always having to make changes, but sometimes you'll realize, you know what, we're not getting far enough in this meeting. I think we need to have another one. So why don't we, you know, schedule an hour, three hour slot, four hour slot, you know, in a couple of weeks time when we can all get together and talk this through. So that ability to kind of extend things, I think, means you, you take advantage of that virtually. But also it can just take longer to help people to, you know, you're trying to help them to build agreement. Um, you don't have that physical interaction that's going on when you're in person that means that people can read body language easily um, and get us and you as a facilitator can get a sense of whether or not uh, people are going along with the process or whether they need to you need to explain it or have a conversation at a particular point in time so you miss things uh, and so I think it, you, you, you've you've got to take longer over it um, 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 in in order to kind of help to check that there is that level of agreement um, as you're going through. You also have obviously just the logistics of it. And fortunately, my internet hasn't dropped out this time, but that will happen. And then you realize, you know, we've got to reschedule another meeting. And, and there are lots of other reasons, I'm sure, why it takes longer. But, but virtually, it often takes longer than it does in person. Um, it is, though, a very, uh, um, so that, that's one thing. The, in terms of in-person workshop, if you were going through the full planning steps, um, you're really talking about three days anyway. Um, and to do that, I've often done a kind of one to two day, sometimes a remote um, thing, um, um, a, a, a remote meeting um, in order to... Uh, I'm sorry, I've just got interrupted by somebody at the door. I was on in a flow then, on a great flow then. Oh, I was on a flow. Whether it was great or not is another matter. Um, but you, I had a two, I had a sort of virtual uh, with that Shrill Carderby session. There was a threat workshop that that happened over two days, um, and then we had a separate two-day workshop with where we got everyone together to actually go through the planning side we could have easily used an extra extra day for that um so somewhere between sort of three five days for that process um um is i think is is common um phil i'm going to come to you for your additional responses i'm going to nip out very quickly and then come back as well no all right can you is that all right yeah um yeah, Julia, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just stick to the in-person um, uh, part of this, given that that's the primary kind of um, uh, emphasis you had in your question. You know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a course, it is a, it, is a, it is a give and take, right? When you're trying to balance the schedules that people have, the complexity of getting people together, but at the same time, really wanting to try to give the different, different kind of elements of a planning process their, their, proper, their proper emphasis, right? Um, uh, I would say that it would um, ideally be best if it were a relatively localized group of people where travel among, you know, across, a, you know, lots of people involving long distances is minimal. You know, if you can get things done relatively locally in person, I think having multiple meetings is really is really a good great way to do it where you can kind of come you can like compartmentalize different elements of the planning process you could have a session on just doing more of the visioning and kind of the upfront you know what is your long view for conservation you could do another set of you know in person sessions on the threat analysis and then you can have a parallel set of sessions on the quantitative risk assessment part of it which feeds into the broader planning process as one kind of component of how you're making decisions around how to how to develop management activities you know, so if you can, if you can kind of compartmentalize things, you can give them a little bit more emphasis, a little, you know, get the, get into them in a little bit more depth. But of course, if this is an international, you know, meeting, 
that um, you know requires a lot of travel and a lot of time commitment that becomes really difficult in which case maybe you do need to actually explore looking at more of a um, virtual um, or, or at least a kind of hybrid where you do some meetings virtually um, and you do you know one or two meetings um, uh, in person I've done that kind of thing before too where we've been able to get some of this work done perhaps maybe some of the more quantitative stuff um, done in in a virtual setting but then really um, you know putting a lot of effort and planning into having one or two meetings in person so it's something that you know I mean it's a process that isn't kind of you know to be taken lightly in terms of the kind of effort and commitment needed to to, to do it but trying to kind of cram it all into a you know single kind of three or four day process can 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 you know uh, you know, result in you maybe not not being able to dig into it into the depth that you'd like to. But if you can do it in a in a in a broken up process, I think that's a that's a really good way to go. I think it's it's very exciting that we we're now more comfortable in the virtual space and that we can do some of these things virtually. And and I I, I feel more and more we're going to do we are going to run sort of these hybrid events where we as phil you've described you know we have a meeting it virtually we do some stuff we have an in-person workshop then there might be some other virtual things to mop certain ideas up finish up on actions or whatever it might be uh, and that combination works where i think we've still got learning to to um, to achieve is a is is hybrid when you've got some people joining virtually and some people in person and that that is challenging, I think, because th then think about those principles around inclusive participation. How do you ensure that those people who are joining virtually feel as 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 much in the room as those people who are actually physically in the room? Uh, and that that takes I mean, it, it's definitely not impossible, um, but definitely takes a lot of thought and probably takes quite expensive sophisticated technology as well and good internet connections to make sure that they are able to 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 to, to do that um and, and and you actually ask about the the different sort of different steps and without going into huge depth um the defining success i just pick up on that one because people often sort of talk about you know how do we how long does it take to get a group to develop a vision and and actually it's, it doesn't need to take very long um, depending on what is required. So sometimes a group is, uh, the stakeholders are at a point where they really, they're, they're going to take a while to work to reach agreement around anything, in which case you might have a two day workshop that's just around developing a vision. But often they're not, there's not that high a level of disagreement. They just haven't talked about it together before. And so you may, in the workshop that was involved in a couple of weeks back with um uh with raptors um the group took um an hour and a half or so to develop the elements of a vision statement and then there was a subgroup that self that that self-selected and the group the, the broader stakeholders were fine with them um volunteering um they worked with me in the evening of that work of the first day to develop one or two draft vision statements that were then presented back to everybody the following day so trying to wordsmith you know trying to actually write a vision statement with a group of 70 people is you know it's, it's painful um but they need to be involved in developing the elements and then subgroups can often work on those and then bring it back to black in plenary to the broader stakeholder group to, to reach agreement around the, the, the final words. So that sort of part doesn't need to take an awful long time if the group is, you know, hasn't got high levels of distrust between them in, in the first place. Um, I can see there are a few other questions. Uh, so Luis, um, multiple states, can you share experience on what are some of the common issues that we encounter and some possible ways to manage them? So I, uh, again, I can't feel I'm going to come to you for your um, um, pearls of wisdom here, um, but to th there, there are loads of roadblocks that can come again, you can come against. I think one of the key ones, um, you know, why are there problems in the planning process? Why doesn't it 
why doesn't it move forward as well as you would have liked it to or the group would have liked it to it is often because the preparing to plan stage has not been done thoroughly enough that they've rushed through with something or sometimes i think the organizing team is too similar um, that actually you need diversity in that organizing team. If, the, if you're basically getting a, you know, a bunch of biologists together to, to be on the organizing team who all want to all care for the species and want that to, you know, want it to be conserved, perhaps all doing maybe different sorts of research, but they're coming at it from a particular angle. Uh, and it'd be the same if it was a different set of, um, of stakeholders. But because of that similarity, it often means they're not. They don't, they don't know enough about the broader stakeholder environment to know who needs to be there. They're also going to have their own biases, as we all do. And that can result in you have a, having a rather narrow, you end up with this group think where, you know, people, they're essentially talking about the same thing and believing the same thing. Um, that doesn't mean to say that is reality. It's just how that particular stakeholder group perceives it. And so I think having diversity in that organizing team is helpful. Um, um, even if that means that it's more challenging to work with because they do actually disagree with each other. Um, but that can be helpful because it's that disagreement is probably going to come out in the workshop if it doesn't come out beforehand. And it's a heck of a lot easier dealing it with it within a small organizing team and helping kind of work out how do we move forward with this than having to do it just when you get everyone, you know, 60, 70 people together. Um, Phil, what, what some of your thoughts on sort of key roadblocks yes i mean they you know they, they they can of course operate at different levels right i mean kind of like what jamie was talking about some of the roadblocks i mean they're certainly they're certainly real roadblocks but they but they tend to be relatively relatively kind of small scale what do i mean by that well there could be different organizations that don't get along with each other different people um, individuals across different organizations that have a long history of disagreeing with each other and kind of actively um, uh, trying to um, uh, delegitimize the other, right, or something like that. That happens. That happens all the time. At least, in, at least we have had many experiences with that kind of that kind of tension that can occur within the organizing team or can occur more commonly within the broader group of of planning participants as a whole right and there can be very active um attempts by people to to kind of discredit the 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 information provided by other people or other organizations right so that 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 needs to be you know that that is something that you know real careful attention to assess design and facilitation can try to to can try to address right you know um, and that's something that we can actually you know provide some some guidance and expertise in in ensuring or at least improving opportunities for everybody being able to be heard and everybody being able to you know um, uh, identify their own concerns and their own needs in a way that 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 allows for free participation and really meaningful kind of collaborative work towards the towards the broader the broader issue of of conserving the species some of the some of the roadblocks are much broader and much more difficult to address right you know and many of the times those those tend to be um you know around really really large scale threats right so when you're talking about conserving a marine turtle species for example that is the um victim of industrial fishing bycatch or something like that right you know that is i mean i see that as kind of a roadblock in a way because of the extreme you know broad um really complex nature of that threat and how to deal with that threat right so that's going to require some really careful thought in terms of who to who to include in those kinds of processes how to engage in those kinds of conversations and how to approach dealing with that threat in a way that we might be able to you know kind of you know take a piece of it and try to understand it better so that we can try to at least try to reduce the intensity of that threat through some kind of mitigative action maybe not reducing it completely or eliminating it right but um but but 
but really focusing in on understanding the nature of the threat and the scope of the threat and the details of the threat in a way that we might be able to further down the road mitigate that threat to a manageable level. Right. So, you know, there's all sorts of different uh, ways to deal with things, and it really requires effectively a, a very structured way of thinking about things and, 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 and organizing the planning process in a way that brings as much evidence to the, to the floor so that you can try to make the most, the most evidence based and the most logical and justifiable decision. Thanks for that, Phil. Uh, one I think one um, thought that comes to mind um, when you talk about roadblocks is so you so there's some sort of barrier, and often that's that can be a, a, a not always, but it can often be a bar seemingly a barrier between people. So there may appear to be some sort of conflict that's going on that you can't sort of move forward on, and. I think one what's helpful to try and clarify before you decide how to respond is actually what the root cause of that that roadblock is. And Phil has described a situation where you've got these sort of these massive threats like like industrial fishing, and that would be an example of a sort of a content point. You know, it's actually it's dealing with the detail of what you're trying to get get to grips with, get to understand and then to, 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 to affect. Um, but there are, and there are often questions that come up around process. And sometimes when you're, if you actually, when you're standing back and looking at what's going on, this interaction that's happening, you will find that certain individuals are talking about process. They're sort of saying, you know, I think then we shouldn't be looking at that now. What we should be doing is this. This is what's most important to do at the moment. And somebody else is saying, no, but we've got to get on with dealing with industrial fishing. And if we can't deal with industrial fishing, then you know, we're never going to save this species. But neither of them are they're neither wrong nor right, but they're, they're dealing with different things. One person is talking about the content, the industrial fishing, and how do we understand that? The other person is saying the process, they, they don't agree with the process. We shouldn't be looking at that now. We should be looking at something else. And trying to tease those apart and, and deal with them separately can often help to move, move to sort of move over what, what appeared to be roadblocks and might actually just be kind of road humps that you can you can get you can get through just by dealing with that and saying okay well Phil you know actually you're talking about this why don't we just check that um, Julia who's you know who's raised the point around what we should be doing next let's just try and work through the process and clarify that um, get that sorted and then come back to industrial fishing and we look at that at the most appropriate point. But trying to separate out those two process conversations with content conversations is often often a helpful step to go through. You, I find as a facilitator, you're regularly you're you're trying to help people to sort of reduce the noise and turn all um, um, so that they that they and in that weaved conflict. Um, into actually just kind of processy steps. You know, we just need to sort things out how we how we approach them. Um, and so when you do get to genuine sort of conflict situations, real um, roadblocks, then you know you've got one, and that and that's when you can devote more time to to work out how you navigate your way through. Um, I appreciate. I can see in the chat some people are saying, "Kind of come to the end of your time. You're going to have to. You're going to have to leave." So, thank you very much for 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 joining for the for the presentation and for the discussion that comes after uh, discussions that come after. Um, if you need to go, then feel free. And um, if if everybody goes, then <laughs> Phil and I will also go. Um, but if not, then we'll we will. You know, it's great to to be able to get further into the the sort of meat of this topic. And I know we've got a couple more questions. So what I suggest we do is we we'll just continue working through some of the questions in the chat. But but also feel free to turn your mics on so we don't just have Phil and my voices. Um, uh, and uh, so we can, you know, continue the discussion, and uh, and then we'll see if we get to the end of that, and and, um, and and we've still got an audience, then we've got an opportunity to go into some small working groups to be able to sort of tackle some particular questions. What what I might do is actually we'll try and keep people together as best we can, and I'll use some of those.
prompt questions um, um, in this space. But but if if appropriate, then we'll, we'll look at moving into breakout groups. If you have to leave now, thank you very much for for joining us. Um, let's just carry on with the chat questions. So Tatiana, uh, the le legislation and the fiscal nature, how that of each country influences the steps of the project. Yeah, it's a great question. And that, again, comes back down to your organizing team who know the system, they know the context, uh, and your questioning of that group to be able to identify whether there are particular legislative requirements that may need to be uh, met in order for you to even undertake the planning project. You know, maybe you need certain permissions um, in order to be able to work in certain areas or or to have a particular to have the meeting in the first place. There may be a need for legislation um, to, to, to come up as a topic within the planning, because it may be that legislative change would help with um, alleviating some of the threats. Um, so identifying whether it's a sort of a process thing we need to get right or whether it will influence the sort of stakeholders we need to have in the group. These are all questions that you need to ask at that preparing to plan stage. So you identify the, the most appropriate process and the most appropriate people to, to, to be involved. And sometimes it may be that lawyers you know, would make sense. In fact, it would often be great if we could have more people coming to these workshops who from these areas. And it, it would be interesting to hear your experiences of trying to bring people together. But I know for us, well, at least for me anyway, I sometimes we, we kind of we're able to identify the right people to come to the workshop. But trying to encourage those individuals who may not be who may not see wildlife as the thing that they care about, getting them to make the time to genuinely be involved in the planning process can sometimes be a challenge. Once you get them there, you, the process often absorbs them and they feel part of it and they get fully engaged. But persuading them that they need to make that time in the first place can be can be challenging. And that, again, is where why you need a lot of time in that preparatory stage to to, to get it right. Um, as, as an example, and then I'll, then I'll shut up um, with a project we've got coming up, a workshop we've got coming up in September, we've been able to involve in the organizing team, one of the um, intergovernmental organizations um, and linked to conventions that countries within the project are signed up to. And so through that, they're able to have a bit more leverage in encouraging the right people, right government representatives to sort of take this process seriously and therefore be there for the for the process. So again, that preparatory stage, thinking about the organizing team, you know, that's where a lot of these conversations can can um, can happen. Um, others, do feel free to to chip in um, if you do have any um, thoughts or ad additional experiences you want to share. Just reading down. Okay, um, so can I just check? I mean, it would be great if there is somebody here. Maybe this is putting the spotlight you on you unfairly, but is there anybody here who is currently embarking on or involved in a planning project that they would be happy to happy to share with this group? You don't have to give the specifics, but uh, maybe a chance just for us to discuss some examples. Sergio, I can see your yeah, camera I, I think I can, I can get the conversation starting. I know people sometimes are reluctant to share. So I haven't been doing, but I've been involved in supporting the Firefly Specialist Group, who, which as a group is doing assess to plan in Southeast Asia. And, and that involves mainly or partially has a great involvement in Malaysia and, and neighboring countries because the species occurs in that region. And I think a lot of the lessons and takeaways that Jamie and, and Philip was discussing did apply there. These species are mostly mangrove 
So part of my role or part of my involvement is to try and get the mangrove specialist group together and bring that expertise to the entomologist. There's of course a lot of government interest sometimes in reforestation, a recovery of these mangroves. As people might know, mangroves are great to reduce uh, the impacts of climate change, for example, as of course they stop uh, natural phenomenon that might uh, have water increase and flooding and all those issues. So there's a lot of civil um, issues going around. So, so yeah, there's a lot of stakeholders and the part of assess to plan was used as a get together of experts where we could, very similar to what Jamie was talking about, the extinction risk of the bumblebee, we were trying to assess the risk of these species and use that as a way to inform which species are naturally more threatened, for example, or naturally coexist in the same environment, try to prioritize where action would be more effective, where action could be or should be prioritized and which stakeholders were involved in those particular sites. It could be uh, native groups or native tribes, native, native people, and also of course, local farmers who are impacted by it, uh, the forest, uh, forestation agencies, things like that. So it was a very interesting process and it does, it's only the beginning, as I said, but it, it is definitely, it does follow very closely the steps Philip was mentioning as well and how to overcome the issues we were addressing. Thanks for sharing that experience, Sergio. And um, did you find, because it's, it, I think the the interplay between, I know we're not getting into great detail on the A to assess the plan, but we did talk a bit about it last time and say for those people who are unsure about it, it's a, it's a process by which you can take groups of uh, often quite specious groups, big groups of species and identify commonalities between those species so that you could theme them up for multi-species planning or identify those species that require sort of single species planning. So it identifies a sort of pathway that they, those groups can then go on and, 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 and be planned for. Sometimes it will actually, it, it, the, the, the actions are so obvious that everybody can kind of go, yeah, well, it doesn't need a plan, you know, that's the action, that's what we need to do. And then you can just sort of get on with it. Um, and I, I just wondered, did you, thinking about stakeholders, to what extent in that situation do you feel that the stakeholders that were there for the assess to plan process were the same as those that were there for red listing? You know, is there, is there a direct mirroring or not quite? Not that there's some. So as people might know or not, uh, fireflies and mangroves of Southeast Asia are often quite a big touristic attraction. And sometimes those tourist, uh, how would I say, companies, they're very locally based. Or, I mean, they hire local people and they will have their expertise and they do involve the scientists. So in a way they're very involved in that, um, in those companies, but often not. So those stakeholders, for example, are not necessarily involved at, in the red listing stage, but they will, I, I hope, or I believe, will be involved going forward, especially because they are, on one sense, those who are more interested to save the species, but on the other, also a cause for threat. If, of course, they don't behave accordingly, if they don't manage their activities properly, like many other uh, animals or wildlife phenomenon that have uh, high popularity, that brings a cost with it, and it has to be managed accordingly. And the plan at this point, because it was focused on the assessment of extinction risk, they, it, wasn't, it was driven by scientists and academics mostly, even though there were, of course, some people there uh, to some extent that do have expertise in tourism or work very closely or actually run those uh, activities, but there was lacking. And uh, there is some mirroring that I wouldn't say is perfect So because the red list is very focused on the scientific knowledge of the species, taxonomic knowledge. Fireflies are a very diverse group or relatively diverse. So it's important to distinguish which species we're talking about because that impacts the management practices due to their biology. It impacts where they exist. Some of them are very narrow in their range. Others are fairly wider spread. So all of that, all of that is the information we were focusing, but that was the expertise we had uh, most at the workshop. Fantastic. Thanks, Sergio. Christina, do you want to share some of your experiences? Hello, everybody. Um, Hi. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for all these webinar series and everything you're doing. I think it's very nice to, to have this introduction for many of the specialist groups that are just at the beginning of trying to do conservation planning for a species. And I just wanted to share some experiences for, for um, conservation plans 
that we have developed in the past for what we call a strategic groups uh, of plants in Colombia within in the framework of, of the national strategy for plant conservation. And then we're also thinking about developing new plants. In, in the case of plants, we have thousands and thousands of species, particularly in a country like Colombia, which is a mega diverse one. We have almost 30,000 species of plants. So we cannot do uh, conservation plants for individual species, you know, it will be <laughs> too difficult. So we, we have uh, chosen some strategic groups like orchids and palms and cycads and timber trees, because we know they're important ecologically, but also, also economically, culturally. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of advancing plant conservation, focusing on, on, on groups that we know are gonna be charismatic in some way. And I just wanted to, to emphasize uh, some of the things that um, Jamie and Phil and other people were saying. I think is in our experience, uh, it has been really, really important to have a diversity of uh, stakeholders, both when designing the plans and, and when implementing the conservation plans. As, as Jamie was saying, most of the people working in biodiversity conservation are biologists or people in, in natural sciences in general. Uh, and we have very specific wishes and desires for biodiversity, uh, but often uh, we are not completely, I'm gonna say, we don't have the whole context of how things work in, in the field, you know, and, and Colombia and I know many other places have very complex socio-ecological uh, scenarios. And sometimes, you know, we're from academia or from botanical gardens or from conservation institutions. And we, we you know, sometimes we don't have enough, enough experiences with complex social, socio-ecological problems. Um, so in our case, in most of our plans, we have very carefully tried to involve particularly people from regional or local environmental authorities, and also from national environmental authorities. And we have tried to combine people working in ex situ conservation, typically botanical gardens, and then people working in in situ conservation, typically from the protected area system, local and, and regional and, and national. And I think it has been a very nice combination, particularly the people that work in the environmental authorities, particularly the local environmental authorities. They're usually not biologists or, or natural scientists. And, and they know about the dynamics, you know, social, economic, cultural dynamics in their territories. So it has been really useful for us because they kind of, you know, they, they kind of make us think about social aspects that we usually don't think about or, or they make us put thing, our ideas and desires for biodiversity into context. I, they kind of, they, they make us, I don't know how to say this in English, like, yeah, yeah. ground us. Mm -hmm. So I think it has been a very, very interesting experience to have a very diverse set of uh, stakeholders. And as Jamie and Phil were saying, sometimes we don't agree, sometimes we have different, even different goals or different interest, but I think discussing and trying to advance uh, in this diversity has been really, really interesting. Thanks, Christina. Um, and do you, with, with that, um, those, with, with the plan for 15,000 species or so, or even if it's less because you've, sub, you've sort of taken groups them, have you within that process thought about the, the level of, granularity the detail that is in that plan and what sits underneath it because because increasingly i think with these big groups of species or with species that cover you know very large ranges um that you that there might be a sort of a, a phased approach to the planning where you're saying you're know, gonna try and bring people together to look at sort of a strategy to sort of give direction general direction but then it's not going to it can't have enough detail in it because it's covering so much to tell everybody what they need to do on the ground in the different in their different contexts. So there's sort of a combination of sort of regional planning or big group planning 
uh, and strategy were underpinned by sort of more specific action planning um, processes. Um, is that some sort of conversation that you have had within the group? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's also very interesting. You were saying before that it, it really depends on the species you're working with. So for example, for timbers, we have only five species we were focusing on for the conservation planning. So for those species, we were able to go and do population surveys and actually design very specific actions for each species. In the case of cycads, we have like 25 species in the country. We have relatively good information about many of them. So yeah, we can go very detailed, even try to do a specific uh, like a set of actions for each species. But then we, we have palms and there are hundreds of them. And then we have orchids and we actually have more than 4,000 species of orchids. And it's just one plant for all the 4,000. So that plant is more general, is more about generating more knowledge and the scientific basis for decision making. And yeah, I mean, there are some actions like take orchids as a charismatic group and try to work with it. For example, in the case of orchids, we have illegal trade and, you know, but there's interest from economic sectors for, for trading orchids legally. So there's a, a whole component that is about orchids in general, right? It doesn't need to be a specific to species. We can, we can advance orchid conservation by trying to regulate the legal trade and trying to stop the illegal trade. No, it doesn't matter which species. So yeah, they're very depending on whether you have many species or not, or you have a lot of information or not. Each plan is very different. It's very, very different. It involves different people, different actions. So, so yeah, that's also very important. It really depends a lot on, on, on the species or the group of species you're working with. And the amount of the species, yeah, it definitely makes a difference. Cool. Yeah, just to just to build on on what you were just talking about, Christina, with you know working with large numbers of species, it, it you can, um, I mean, we've been thinking a lot about how to plan for multiple species on a, on kind of a threat axis, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you know, with you know, yeah. because a lot of the same threats are going to be impacting a large number of species, and your orchid example is a really good one, and maybe the cycads or something like that would be really similar. Right. So um, if you can really understand the kind of dynamics of of the um, economic threats, essentially, or kind of the collector threats or whatever, whatever the case might be um, for a large group of species, um, you may be able to tackle that threat in a way that the that the, you know, the status of a large number of species could be improved. Um, relatively consistently by really, really, really understanding that threat, right? I was just in Liberia just a couple, uh, maybe a week or two ago, looking at bushmeat issues, focused originally on chimpanzees, but um, really trying to understand the kind of supply chain of where bushmeat goes, who's, who's hunting it, who's selling it, who's buying it, who's distributing it, who's eating it, you know, and, and, and by doing that kind of an analysis, you know, we find that the same kinds of issues cut across a large number of different species, right? So, um, you know, and there's more and more literature coming out around that kind of threat-based planning where you can really tackle a large number of species in a relatively compact period of time with potentially a fairly compact group of stakeholders. As long as you can get people that have that type of knowledge about that, about the economic drivers of that threat, right? So that sounds good, Christina. Thanks for that. One thing that you're both um, reminding me of is the importance uh, with that organizing group at the beginning of clarifying for everyone, both, both in terms of being able to get the process right, but also getting expectations right uh, around what you're actually trying to produce, uh, produce at that point in time. Um, so, you know, what, what are people going to have in their hands? And if, if people are comfortable that by the end of this process, we're going to have a strategic plan that will give us general direction for this big group of species, that's very different from saying we want to have a, a detailed action plan that tells us specifically what to do with each species. Now, 
a lot of a lot of conversations that I find I have anyway are a, around trying to make explicit the implicit assumptions that people have. So, and that happens right at the beginning as well with the organizing team with some people thinking, this is great. We're gonna have this wonderful detailed action plan that's gonna come out the other end of the process. Other people thinking, yes, finally, we're gonna have a strategy that's just gonna give us general direction and we'll know roughly where we're going to. And you're there in the middle. And if you don't clarify things, you will design a process that helps them to get yeah, one group gets to where they want to get to, but the other group may well be disappointed or maybe reacting to you, what you're proposing, not because what you're proposing is wrong, but just because what you're proposing is different to what they were thinking they were trying to achieve. So having those conversations, both with the small groups and the bigger groups to say, what do you actually mean? What is it you really want to have coming out of it? You know, if you imagine at the end of these three days and I say, there you go, what does there you go mean? What is in your hand at the end of this? And getting, getting to write it out and then be able to reflect it back to the whole group and say, so this is what you want, is that right? Getting that agreement, uh, and you'll do exactly the same thing as well when you get, have the workshops when everyone's together, just at a larger scale, is critically important to, to ensure those expectations are, 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 are appropriate. Um, cool, thank you for that, Christina. Um, any, any other, Thoughts. I'm conscious we were, we've been together for an hour and a half or so, and it, uh, if there, um, I don't think it would be appropriate now to split off. Um, and I, it's good that we're having this conversation. So I'm I'm very happy for us to kind of keep going like this. Appreciate some of you may need to if, if some of you need to leave. Um, but does anybody have any uh, any other questions? And there are no there are no silly questions. <laughs> if you're uh, if you've got a question in your mind, the chances are somebody else in this group has that same question. Um, does anybody have anything else they'd like to ask or or an experience that they'd like to like to share? Sorry, that is that that would be my mum who's trying to ring me on my phone to have a chat with me. And, uh, I do not want to have her advice at the moment in this webinar. Okay, so I'm turning her off. <laughs> any uh, any thoughts um, from the group? Michelle. Michelle, did you have a question or is it just you got your mic on? Okay, um, in which case, oh. I don't know. Yeah. I can hear you now, yes. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so just had a question about, um, we're about to embark on a species action planning process um, with the Kenyan government for pangolins, um, which is led by the government. And we've, we have tried to um, understand what the process would be for having an action planning process be IUCN endorsed and with a very defined process that the government already has for action planning, for species planning, um, what is the pros and cons, I guess, and um, is it something to be concerned about if the document is not necessarily going to be endorsed by IUCN, even if it's following many of the same principles and has the relevant specialist group members involved in the process? Um, it, seem, it might seem like a very simple question, but one that keeps coming up um, as we're in the beginning phases of this now. So I just wondered if anyone's experienced something similar um, and any advice you have on that. Thanks, Michelle. I know um, we, we've had uh, I had this question before and I asked different people within the SSC and I was told that, well, look, you've got, if you are part of a specialist group, you have IUCN, you've got the IUCN logo. You know, do, do you need to do more than that? You're going to have the IUCN logo on it. If it is an official specialist group, you know, a specialist group supported um, plan, then you've got the right to be able to use that, that, that logo. Um, um, Phil? Would you, what would you say? 
Oh yeah, well, I mean there doesn't have yeah right there doesn't have to be an official endorsement, Michelle, of the of the plan itself, right? I mean there's there's an opportunity for for you and your colleagues when when you're producing the plan to be very explicit about you know the process by which you develop the plan, the way in which you um, used or were guided by the different types of principles and steps to conservation planning that Jamie's been talking about here, um, which has been endorsed by the by the SSC, by the Species Survival Commission overall. Um, uh, so, you know, there's there 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 can be ample opportunity for for conveying the you know the 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 endorsement essentially the kind of implicit endorsement i guess of the of 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 the ssc and the iucn through the um through as jamie says not only the logo but also kind of explaining the process and explaining the the kind of principles and the philosophy behind the planning that you that you engage in you know um and that can be combined with the various kinds of national um authorizations that that you'd be working on in kenya did you say right did you say kenya so I think that would be I think that would be fine as well. And actually, Michelle, and for others as too, we have got a if if you are following the principles of planning, then there is um, there is some text that we're also able to provide um, that that kind of to sort of the, 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 that um, allows you to kind of illustrate that within the, the, the plan itself. So uh, free to get in touch with me afterwards if, if um, that's, that's helpful. Um, it, I mean, Michelle, with, with what Phil has said, um, does that kind of answer your question? Does that help you? Yes. Or is there something, anything that you feel is still kind of bothering you? No, that, that clarifies a lot. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Yeah. And when are you when are you about to embark on that? Um, so the the first inception workshop is probably due to happen in the next month or so, um, and then for the whole process to have been concluded by October November is what the current timeline is looking at. But it's been in the planning stages for about a year, um, and so yeah, it's been balancing between trying to get as much stakeholder engagement as possible and supporting the government in, in reaching out to stakeholders, um, but also not necessarily being the leads of the process. And so being led by um, what the ask has been. Um, yeah. It's interesting that kind of the ownership side of the plan and, um, and you know, we, we, it kind of feels like it's a no brainer really, but I, th I think that it's not necessarily, um, fully appreciated but the you know the the people who own the it may be that there's needs to be an official owner of the plan you know it may require that there is a national authority as it is our plan you know we are endorsing we are we're department of water and forests and we're the ones that are going to be overseeing the implementation in the plan um mm. but they are one of the stakeholders uh, they mm. will, uh and 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 you know we would strongly advocate that the plan for one thing the plan is not i, I would have said anyway you know the plan is not our plan and if we if i was actually and this is a personal thing probably and i don't know whether feel you say the same but even if i wasn't in the cps in cpsg but i was a member of you know i was working with another specialist group i would strongly advocate that you know it's not us as a specialist group that owns the plan you know it is it is unless we're involved in the implementation of that plan that's different but the but it's the implementers of the plan that need to own that plan we may be able to facilitate it. We may be the ones that are involved in helping to get it, you know, produced. Um, but uh, I may help to design the process. But but it's really important that ownership is at least felt by, or sorry, is is at least it, it, the owners need to at least involve the people who are going to implement the plan. If it sits outside of that group, then you're already hamstringing yourself in terms of the likelihood of of implementation. So how do you get that? Then you kind of work backwards from that point and say, how do you make sure that the process results in those that those groups seeing this as theirs? Yes. And yeah. That, and that's where you, I mean, you talk about kind of taking a year to sort of get round to this this time, and and then you've got. You know, I imagine it's being is happening online if it's happening over a period of months. Um, but 
however it is, you've obviously got a number of stages you're going through, but giving enough time and enough space for the process and the people to come together and take ownership of it um, is critical to it not ending up on the shelf or just them ending up on the shelf. Yeah, thank you. That's sound advice. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody want to sort of come back on anything or have either alternative or additional perspectives they'd like to like to share? No? Okay, then I have a um, I've got a question that I'd like to put into the chat and I'd like to see this might be another uh, tumbleweed moment which I tend to create rather too often um, but I am going to just put a question in um, just now into the chat and just ask if you and you can either write your responses in um, in the chat or turn your microphones on uh, and see what you um, you think about this so between planning and implementation you know we would often say is it's important to help stakeholders identify how they'll organize themselves to oversee implementation the sort of governance side of the project decision making communication oversight um, and i just wondered what your view of the importance of this is on project implementation and that and that that experience might might come from not being involved in planning projects but actually being part of projects how important is it um that that, that time is spent thinking about that organization of people um to oversee make decisions and communicate around the around the project and andrea we'll come to you in a second but i just want to see if anybody's got any thoughts on this because this this is something that Kind of wakes me up at night a number of times thinking about how do I, you know, it's not my plan, so I can't tell people to do X, Y, or Z. Um, so how do we design the processes? How do we encourage people to think about this? And is it is it actually that important? Or if they've got the plan written down, they know who's going to do what, by when, you know, is that enough? Any thoughts on that? I want to ask Marvelin Kisto, because you've got an incredible picture of, a, of an incredible cat there. Um, and so I keep getting drawn to it. You're also in the center of my screen, but I don't know whether you have a thought on this, um, this, uh, this point around um, the governance of projects and how people organize themselves and how we can help them to organize themselves. How important is that, that, that sort of governance of projects from your experience or, or from others? So we have agreed that Marvelin has a beautiful cat. Um, so it's now confirmed. That is official. That is now fact. Um, so Peter, you say, as a governance is essential and for a plan to be implemented, governance needs to be worked out, responsibilities assigned accordingly. As soon as a plan or strategy starts taking, as soon as, as, soon as it starts taking shape. Would you say, Peter, that that's the point where you get in you get it sorted when you kind of know what it is that everyone's going to be doing and then you say right so how are we going to organize ourselves does it happen then um does it happen earlier does it happen you know, um, and also does it happen naturally um or is it something we need to we need to encourage peter i would think that to a large extent it should happen naturally in the process as the elements start coming together what is the plan about what are the actions that we envisage what is the strategy who are the stakeholders we need to sort that out right as these elements are coming together uh, and in the process of doing that you almost certainly will find out who are the leaders who are the followers who have the authority to make changes and who are well-intended contributors but they don't have the resources the authority the processes or whatever to actually make things happen 
So this is something that, as I have experienced it, as I see it, it's something that grows as part of the process. But it is extremely important to keep that in mind that it needs to be part of the process before we rush too far into practical uh, activities. Thanks very much for that, Peter. Um, yeah, and then trying to get that, you're describing that, that, that combination of people who have got authority um, with people who might actually, they're, they're not necessarily the same thing as the people who've got authority and the people who do the actions on the ground may not be part of the same, you know, they're not necessarily the same, are they? And often, I mean, it's, it is a, maybe a stereotype and it's not the case all the time at all, but, but you will often think of governments as being ones that hold authority to be able to give permission to sanction certain activities, but implementers in, in, in a number of parts of the world are the NGOs, you know, they're the ones that are out there kind of doing the work on the ground. However, they don't have the authority to be able to, you know, to get those permissions. So, so at least thinking about how do these two groups kind of come together? So the ground is laid, the groundwork is laid for the implementers to get on and do their work. And, and how do you make sure that um, the, the authorities are still also kept in the loop? You know, there, I think there is, uh, coming from having spent all my life working in the NGO sector, I can definitely, you know, I've got lots of examples of runoff and done what they thought was right, they're probably thinking rather arrogantly about what our limited, limited utility of government. And um, this is thinking about it for you, this is my thinking about my previous roles. Um, and, uh, and I've tried to despite government as opposed to trying to work with government. And so that, I think that, that kind of combination, whatever organizations those are, um, but trying to think about how they at least maintain those, those links going forward is key. Um, something that actually just been involved just finishing off now with a group is this terms of reference for the governance body and it has been a really uh, this, this has been developed by a subset of stakeholders within this process and it's been a very interesting process to develop referencing you know, what's the purpose of this of this particular governance group in this case it is to oversee implementation of the strategy it's all about implementation of the strategy but who are the members going to be you know how do we make sure there's balance in that membership um so it's not all one you know it's not skewed towards the interest of one group or another how are they going to communicate out from there um, um what other sort of subgroups are going to be developed um, uh, and how do they go about developing those subgroups in order to help with implementation? And in this particular terms of reference, they've actually, the stakeholders are really clear that they wanted that group to be one step removed from government, but at the same time be able to connect with government. And so they actually spent a while crafting the words that, uh, uh, um, and, and the process by which there would be a degree of independence of this governance group to, and it was this it was done in this way because they wanted to build trust and, that, and trust was quite low at the time um so there'll be lots of different ways of doing it but but creating space for those conversations about how implementation will be overseen how decision making um authority etc will be uh, will be either shared or taken um uh it's critical i think to to the success of those projects Thanks very much, Peter, for um, for that. Um, Phil, would you add anything to that? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Um, and Christina, you said, I think governance is very important, although not easy to agree upon. Crucial to have a clear leadership and make implementation a reality. And, and actually, if many of you are coming from specialist groups, I think this, this conversation is particularly important. Um, when you think about well, what what is our role going to be in this implementation are, are we part of the implementing implementing body or are we experts who can contribute knowledge information to that body uh, how do we interact with it so that 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 so i think again think, uh, considering expectations you're clear on what you know what you're going to both get out of it and be able to put into it and where does responsibility sit not just for individual actions but actually oversight of the whole thing Sergio you're saying you think it's super important assign assign, assign actionable points to specific stakeholders yeah so that's that that 
that there's that there's two layers there's the detailed actions who's going to do what by when in the, that specifying action section which you do within the planning process and then there's this other layer i always think about anyway that sits above that and it may just be one person or it could be a group that says how are we implementing this pro project is everybody doing what they said they were going to do is is the result of those actions what we expected them to be, or is it different and do we need to change things? So there's that extra layer of, of authority that needs to be above. Um, I appreciate we're, we're coming towards the end of our two hour session now. Um, Jamie, and... Jamie, don't forget Andrew, um, Andrea's question about- Oh yes, oh, thank you, um, yeah. Yeah, a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, um, I know, I can't find it. Do you want to? Oh yes, yeah. Right, so Andrew, yeah, you're asking, due to update the National Plan for Conservation of Freshwater Turtles for um, Columbia uh, happening next semester. So Andrea, are you involved in, in sort of design of that, of that process? Hello. Hi there. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, Yes, I was involved in the original. We have two previous works uh, for that. And I, uh, I will be involved because I am part of the network for the conservation of turtles of Colombia. Uh, that includes marine and freshwater and terrestrial ones. And we are in the process to start uh, designing this. Uh, what we did previously, was to evaluate um, the, the, the previous strategy to see how, how much we accomplish. Uh, we never, what, what things never work out, uh, who people that say will, um, that was involved in the original plan uh, never show up. And uh, we need to evaluate that to start um, doing the draft. So with activities, we're going to continue which ones uh, we are going to uh, erase from the NETS uh, strategy. And yes, just to evaluate to start doing something uh, with clearly governance, uh, with, um, we assign responsible people uh, with names of the NGO, with, clear, uh, with the representatives of uh, the government, um, is something like that. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying to start this the next semester. Uh, I will let you know how it works. We're planning to, to use the principles and the staff documents. Um, so that, that's my contribution. Fantastic, Andrew. And when you were evaluating the previous strategy, um, yes. did, you, did you identify um anything that you would change about the process is there any lessons that you learned about how that last strategy was produced that makes you think ah oh, this time we'll 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 do more of this or we'll do less of that yes i think we need to do more of involving uh clear uh key persons uh people that we know will be uh, in the organization during the uh, time of the strategy, because sometimes we involve people uh, that are just could be new in the organization or just move quickly. And we lost this kind of, maybe the representative of the organization, the involvement, uh, the effort to, to capacity building, we lost all this. So I need to, we need to be cle cle really clever about selecting the people we're going to involve in the, in the governance. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for that. Not, so would you, oh. Not just for the government, but even for communities uh, and for N NGOs. Go. Yeah, Andrea, when was the when was the last plan produced? How old is that uh, plan? 
the, the, we evaluated the strategy that was from 2012 to, to 2013. And our last proposal was from 2015 to, to 2020. So we, ha we are two years due in evaluate and produce a new document. And do you have inform? Um, have you have you had colleagues or other uh, other people actually monitoring the status of the of the um, of the species so that you can not only not only evaluate the kind of you know the 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 sociology of the implementation, but also seeing yeah. if you have a bio you know if you can demonstrate an impact of the of the activities that have already been implemented. Do you have that information? Um, that have been like a voluntary effort of very engaged researchers, uh, okay. but there's no no uh, such like a, a formal follow up uh, of the completeness of the strategy and the and the effort uh, coming from the government, for example. And I think that's a real a weakness uh, of this kind of planning processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, doing that kind of monitoring, I mean, that real, that really detailed on the ground biological monitoring, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to do, it can be expensive, it can be difficult, just logistically, and um, methodologically, but you know, really important to be able to to be able to go back after a number of years and say, okay, you know, have we have we has 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 the have the actions that we've recommended for implementing on the ground have they actually had an impact? You know, um, and if not, why not? Right. So um, yeah, I mean, it's tough, but you know, if if it's possible to build that type of more intensive monitoring effort into the next round of planning that will that will make that 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 new version of the plan that much more effective. Yes, what ha we have been doing is to uh, monitor new research uh, mm -hmm. related to to all the species involved or covered by the strategy. Um, and we monitor these. We are in contact with the main researchers that are involved with each of the species, including the plant. And thus all that information, we, we take into account all that information to see mm -hmm. if it happens, if not. For example, we have uh, an endemic species of a freshwater turtle. Um, and what has been doing all these years is, is being, uh, uh, risk, risk, uh, rescue of the hatchlings um, and release of the animals. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's new research that is saying that we have two different, uh, not, not sub species, but two different uh, conservation units of these species. So for the new strategy, we need to change the strategies for that. Mm. Okay. So, so that, that's the, the way we're, we're working, but it's right. all voluntary work, no, no, no part of the a planning a strategy of the government for monitoring the implementation. And this happens with all the species in my country, mm -hmm. as Christina mentioned. Andrew, can I ask you another, another question? Is, of is course. That right? Yeah, because I'm intrigued by the time frame of those plans. How did, because you, did, was there one that was one year and then one that was four or five years? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So what, 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 how was that decided? You know, how long is this plan going to be? This was decided for? taking into account that the government produced a national program for the species. And that program, will be due or was due in 2020. So um, as we were seeing that nothing was happening with that program, national program that was issued for the government, we decided to uh, just meet and do a plan and just make things happen. And that's the reason we, we choose that time frame. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you for that. But yeah, sorry, carry on. What we're, what we're planning to do now is 
because we we were like in close conversations with the with the representative of the government and we we mentioned we we presented the the previous evaluation in a congress of our herpetology and we mentioned to this person of the environmental authority yeah hey we did this we evaluated the program we completed uh this percent of each activity and what we asked us was could you please provide this to the environmental ministry and if you give us that results or information we can request uh, funds for new workshops and things like that it's not the work that they are doing it's our work but that is a tool for um, access to to give to have access for money government funding to continue that's well, in interesting that you're thinking about how do you tie in the time frame to to other policies and program sort of uh, sort of other time frames that are relevant and and i think we can it's it all of this is about influence not control you know none of us can control what actually happens but um but 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 try but there is there is a i think there's good sense in saying you know what what is it that's the time frames that other people are working on that they care about um you know is it linked to cbd or is it some other international convention or something national that's the, that that is just a rolling cycle of things um but then obviously you, you then you then need to also ask is that time frame relevant for the species that we're concerned with as well does it fit biologically you know does can, can we achieve very much in five years and then you have to think about logistically you know if if, if what you want to achieve is you know species going from like that to going like that you know have you got do you think you know one has the the you got the information do you have the resources to be imagine you can do that within a short time frame um and so all these questions i think are really helpful to ask within that organizing team to help identify the most appropriate time horizon uh and it may be that you might want to do it within you know, maybe there's a um uh in fact actually with with morocco with this sort of recent project i've been involved in they said they don't want to look too far into the future because they recognize they're just starting out and they've got very limited understanding of what's really going on so they know they've got they're probably going to do lots of changes in the next few years as they get get out there and get more information they also want to tie in with a sort of a government sort of normal cycle but they also recognize that it's going to take a bit of time to be able to make changes and so they've got a sort of a 10-year long-term goal longer or mid-term goal and a five-year more detailed action plan with other projects they're they're looking ahead 30 40 50 years maybe 100 years ahead and so they're setting visions and these long-term goals on the horizon but then they're giving themselves much more detailed plans to planning that happens on a shorter time frame, which they can influence more, uh, more, more effectively. And what, just one last point on that is, by by setting time frames that of a reasonable length, it often allows all stakeholders to imagine, and that includes whether it's government, non-government, private landowners, whoever they might be, to imagine a world where they can see their needs being met even if it might take a while to get there so it allows you to get that collective direction agreed collective direction sorted and there's that just a little bit more chance that people are then going to buy into the shorter term actions that they need to undertake because they can see this longer term future that looks pretty good um, so I think that's sort of combining and there's no right or wrong about it, but but combining time frames of sort of long term directional thinking with short term, more detailed planning can, that seems to be something that 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 comes up quite often. It seems there's a sort of a, a logic to it anyway. Yes. Um, Thank you for that, Andrew. Yeah, I don't know that may that maybe is not helpful to you at all, but, but it's just <laughs> something that your 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 case study sort of made me think about. So thank you very much for sharing that. 
Um, I appreciate we're, we're, we're coming to the end of the of the two hours. It's already gone. Um, and um, so it's a last chance just now to ask anything or question. Um, is there anything that we've missed? I don't think there's anything we missed in the chat. Um, Phil, do you want to add anything before we um, wrap up? No, I'm good. This has been a really good discussion and a bunch of really good, uh, really good questions. So it's been, it's been, uh, it's been a quick and informative two hours. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. And um, thank you very much to everyone for joining. As I mentioned before, there are, uh, there's another series of webinars. If you know, Sergio mentioned the, the assess to plan process, and that's going to be the next webinar, which I think is on the, um, the 11th i'm just looking at my powerpoint again uh yeah the 11th of july um and um so please sign up for that if you want to sign up for it then go to the um the website and i'm just going to put it again in the chat to go there um, some, uh, uh, somebody kindly mentioned before that the principles and steps document is, um, thanks Sergio, um, um, the principles and steps document is produced in multiple languages. So it's English, French, and Spanish. Uh, and if somebody wants to get involved in translating into other languages, then, then superb. But there are three languages up on the CPSG website. So if you just go to... Um, www.cpsg.org and then you um, look for um, you just type in um, principles and steps then you should get to that document and you can download it um, and just to wrap up um, today what we've been looking at are the practical steps that are often involved in producing plans that that um, that um, are underpinned by the the, the, the seven principles. And this is moving from that preparatory stage, preparing to plan, um, which you do in advance of the, of, the, of the process itself. You've got that key organizing team that is helpful to, to be a sounding board for the design of the process, for identification of stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you're actually having the event and that event could be online, it could be in person, could be one workshop, could be multiple workshops. You're going to change that to suit the process but it's probably going to take more time than, than perhaps people will want it to take it's going to it's going to be a few days or it's going to be multiple sessions because you're trying to build agreement and you're trying to do good thinking or help the group to do good thinking as they do that and then you've got the other steps that you're going to go through in that process from understanding the system um you know identifying how they're going to act on the system uh, and and then don't forget before they finish off they need to be thinking about how do we organize ourselves around the project to make sure that the governance structure is solid and we can actually we're most likely to be able to put this plan into practice next session assess the plan a more a, a specific planning process that 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 fully resonates with the the, the planning principles um, but it is a, a different planning process because you're trying to do a different thing with that assess the plan uh, and Caroline Lees, who was with us and it was with us in the last webinar, will be leading on uh, on that one. So please sign up um, for that. Um, Sam has put the um, the the oh Sam has put the both. Well, he's put lots of he's put a, a web link in there. So please go to that. Um, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, great to spend time with you. Um, thanks, Phil, for your time and. Um, all the best uh, and thanks again to the Global Centre for for, um, uh, for promoting this and making the connection between us and you. Indeed. All right. Thanks, Bye everybody. Thanks, Cheers. Jamie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.